Carolina Woods, and today I'd like to introduce Dr. Darren Ingalls. He's a licensed doctor of naturopathic medicine in the state of California. He is a fellow with the American Academy of Environmental Medicine and fellow with the Medical Academy of Pediatric Special Needs. Dr. Darren Ingalls has been published extensively and he is the author of two books, The Natural Pharmacist, Lowering Cholesterol and Natural Treatments for High Cholesterol. He also has written a chapter on allergy desensitization for autistic children in cutting edge therapies for autism and is the author of the book, The Lyme Solution, a five part plan to fight the inflammatory autoimmune response and beat Lyme disease. Dr. Ingalls' practice focuses on environmental medicine with special emphasis on Lyme disease, MS, autism, PANS, PANDAS, and chronic immune dysfunction, including allergies, asthma, recurrent or persistent infections, and other genetic or acquired immune problems. His practice is comprised of both children and adults. He uses diet, nutrient, herbs, homeopathy, and immunotherapy, along with conventional med medical therapies to help his patients achieve better health. Dr. Ingalls, thank you so much for speaking with us today. I'd like to turn it over to you so you can provide us with an overview of uh, of your five-part plan to fight uh, inflammatory autoimmune response and beat Lyme disease. I know, I felt like we should have had that title shorter. <laughs> <laughs> it was a tongue twister, I'll give you that. <laughs> I know. Well, you know, in my practice, you know, I see a lot of people with Lyme disease. I see a lot of children with autism. So it's always a function of, you know, what is it that's underlying each individual that might be triggering, you know, this element of inflammation? You know, the, I, every child with autism, I'd say, is uniquely different. The way it impacts them can be, you know, different from child to child. So we can't just make a blanket statement that all kids on the spectrum are, you know, the same. They're just completely different. And therefore, the things that set them off can be very different. So, you know, as an empathic doctor, functional medicine practitioner, we're always looking at root cause of illness. You know, what is it that becomes those triggers? And the other thing we see a lot in autism is this element of immune dysfunction. There's something in the immune system that doesn't function well. That's why we see a lot of these gastrointestinal problems. We see a lot of these neurological issues, sometimes skin issues. A lot of these, you know, inflammatory conditions that's really just the manifestation of something that's going on in the immune system that's not functioning well. So what is that thing or what are those things that are becoming those immune triggers? And what I find is about 30%-ish of my population of kids on the spectrum do test po positive for Lyme disease or some other tick-borne illness. So it is a fairly common occurrence in this population like my other colleagues too that you know treat uh, populations very similar to mine. We've all kind of experienced the same thing and that 30% seems to be pretty consistent. So it's just one of those things I think as a parent, you know, have you gone down the path of investigating, you know, Lyme disease or any other type of infectious agent as a potential underlying trigger? Because if there's something there, it gives you something actionable that you can actually do something about. And I think that's what's so frustrating for a lot of folks too, is that, you know, as a parent, again, you see your child having these different issues. You just want to know how to fix them, get them better. But if you don't really understand what it is that's going on, it's hard to apply the right treatment, right? I mean, so many of you parents have gone through, you know, treatment after treatment after treatment, just hoping something sticks without necessarily understanding of the why of what's going on in the first place. So if we can get better information about that why, about you know, what is it that's triggering the immune system, what is it that's causing that inflammatory problem? Again, something that's very actionable and potentially measurable in addition to how your child's responding, you know, we might have a test, we might have another blood value that we can model over time to see, are we getting, you know, clinical improvement? So I think Lyme is one of those things that, you know, should be on, you know, every parent's radar, if you have a child on the spectrum, just to rule out as a possibility. And we run into a little bit of a problem that Lyme testing, unfortunately, is not great. Most kids on the spectrum hate getting their blood drawn for a lot of reasons. Most kids hate getting their blood drawn, right? Nobody wants a needle put in their arm. But it really is the best way for us to assess if there's been any kind of exposure to Lyme or other tick-borne illness. Unfortunately, the labs out there like Quest and LabCorp, these conventional reference labs, the test kits that they use aren't necessarily the most sensitive. 
Uh, we know from the research that if you've got active Lyme disease, the test can miss more than 50% of people who actually have Lyme disease. Uh, I was a microbiologist before I was a doctor. I used to do these tests for a living. And as a former lab tech, that's a terrible test. You know, when it can't even pick up half the people that have the problem, means if you've got a positive test, that's great. It just confirms that you know, your child's had that exposure. But if it comes back negative, it doesn't exclude the possibility that it might still be part of the underlying issues. Sometimes you have to dig a little bit deeper. Fortunately, there are labs out there that do offer better Lyme testing and other tick-borne illness. So we use labs, iGenetics out of Palo Alto, California, or medical diagnostic labs in Hamilton, New Jersey. These labs offer more sensitive test kits. The way they report it's a little bit different. So the odds of picking up Lyme or other tick-borne illness goes up a little bit when you use these different labs. So if it's something that you're considering and you haven't done with your child, you'll definitely want to get in the hands of a practitioner that understands these tests, knows how to interpret them correctly, and you know actually has the ability to send it to the right labs. Because if you've gone through and you said you just did the test with a regular reference lab and it came back, you know, looking looking normal, you might want to dig a little bit deeper with one of these other labs just to ensure that your child hasn't had that exposure. So go through the process. You do the test. You know, maybe there's some evidence there that your child's had this exposure. You know, now what? And I guess before I move on to the now what, let me also clarify with the test. If we look at the way these the bodies are made, uh, because we are measuring antibodies, this is the immune response to Lyme and these infections, and we're not measuring it directly on, on whether it's growing in the body. Unfortunately, Lyme is very hard to culture. Uh, there have been labs before that have tried and have not been terribly successful. So we're really measuring the immune response to that organism. So as you can imagine, if you've got a child that's got an underlying immune problem and certainly an immune deficiency, the ability to make antibodies against Lyme and these other bugs might be complicated compromised. And therefore, again, a negative test doesn't exclude the possibility. So often what we're looking for in the Lyme testing is evidence of Lyme-specific antibodies. We know in 40 years of research, some of these antibodies are very specific to Lyme, some of them are not. So if we see evidence of Lyme-specific antibodies, whether it meets the CDC criteria for calling Lyme, the Lyme test positive, in my world, it doesn't really matter. It's kind of like being a little bit pregnant, right? I mean, you are or you aren't. So if you've got Lyme-specific antibodies, and your child has some of the symptoms suggestive of Lyme, you know, that can be a pretty good indication that, you know, that there's been that exposure. I think it gets to be very challenging as a parent to try and delineate what is a symptom of autism and what's a symptom of Lyme disease. Because honestly, yeah. there's a lot of overlap. You know, there's, the, if your child has, you know, their head banging, if they're toe walking, if they're, you know, got some other behavioral issue that you can't quite explain, they'll go from being perfectly normal normal to being completely out of control at the drop of a hat and you're like what changed you know Lyme can create a lot of these kind of symptoms so it's so easy to think that oh my child is just you know this is just an autistic you know trait that my child has but again if you look from child to child on the spectrum their symptoms are so completely different so what is the difference again between what's a Lyme symptom, what's an autism symptom? Now, I should say, in the, you know, in all the kids I've treated over the years, when we treat their Lyme disease, a lot of their symptoms get better, and in some case, goes away. I have yet to see a child that completely loses their autism diagnosis just because we treated Lyme disease. So, is it part of the problem? Absolutely. Is it the entire of the problem? Absolutely not. So please don't think that if you just treat Lyme disease, everything's going to be normal, your kid's going to be fine. It doesn't really work that way. But it does help figure out, again, truly what is part of the, the other medical conditions related to autism versus, again, what is this you know, organism that's provoking the immune system? So if you get to that point where you've established, yes, there's been exposure, you've got a test that corroborates that, you've got clinical symptoms that suggest it, you know, now what's the next step? You know, from a conventional standpoint, treatment really gets geared about killing the bug. So, you know, if you get a CC positive test, they say give, you know, 14 to 21 days of antibiotics, depending on the age of the child, usually it's either doxycycline if they're over eight years old or amoxicillin. Uh, and so you take that course of action. And at the end of that time, no matter how you are, you're done. And what we've learned is that that treatment is often not adequate enough 
to treat Lyme disease. What makes Lyme kind of unique too is that it is a very slow growing organism. Bacteria in your body replicate every 10 to 15 minutes. Lyme grows every one to 16 days. That is incredibly slow. If your child gets a throat infection, strep throat, you can put them on a course of antibiotics for up to a week, and usually that equates to get rid of the infection and then they're fine. But you know, most antibiotics work best when the organism's in a replication phase. So if it's not replicating, the antibiotics don't really do very much, especially something like doxycycline. Doxycycline actually doesn't really kill anything. All it does is it stops the bacteria from replicating. So it's still dependent on your system to be able to go in and help eradicate the infection. So for these slow growing organisms, I mean, even something like tuberculosis, you know, if someone TB, they're on a triple antibiotic cocktail for up to a year and TB replicates every 15, 20 hours. So much, much slower than 10 to 15 minutes, but still not as slow as one to 16 days with Lyme disease. So we've got this sort of disconnect in how long we're willing to treat Lyme, even from a conventional standpoint, knowing that it's such an incredibly slow growing organism. But the conventional them is, you know, give them up to three weeks, maybe you'll get a month from some doctors on antibiotics. And kind of regardless of how you are at that point, you're done. That was enough to get rid of it. Uh, I think many of us in the Lyme community know that that's not enough. In fact, the International Lyme and Associated Disease Society recommends less than six weeks of antibiotics and sometimes longer, really depending on clinical response. So that is a way uh, and certainly for someone who's had acute exposure to Lyme disease or these other tick-borne infections, that is very appropriate. That's, that's probably the best time. Get it early, hit it hard, hopefully eradicate it before it gets deeper into the body and it's creating any further kind of issues. More often than not, though, what I see in my practice are people who don't have acute Lyme disease. You know, and some of the symptoms, just to be aware of acute Lyme disease, this bullseye rash that looks like a target on the skin is a telltale sign of Lyme disease. There's no other skin rash that looks just that. That's what we call pathognomonic or very Lyme disease. It's a flat rash. It doesn't really tend to be itchy and it tends to spread over the course of days to weeks. Uh, looks quite different than eczema and other types of skin rashes that you see in kids. So the bullseye rash is a telltale sign, fever, headache, joint pain, numbness and ting, uh, swollen glands, chills. Sometimes you can get what's called Bell's palsy, one side starts to droop. Uh, there's really upwards of a, a hundred symptoms related to Lyme disease. But people with acute Lyme disease are acutely sick. You know, you've got a sick. And often what happens is you take your child to the pediatrician, get exam, and they say, oh, they got some sort of viral illness. Just watch it, and fluids, rest, and allow on its own. And of course, depending on how your child's affect autism, if you have a nonverbal child who can't express what they're doing, it's really challenging. As a parent, you're just observing your kid and you're just seeing what looks different. But I think, you know, as parents, you know your child better than anyone else. And when you start to see these come up that are very unique and different, then you kind of know that yeah, there's something I need to investigate further. If you have a child who's verbal and can express that, yes, my joints hurt, yes, my body hurt, yes, my head hurts, uh, very helpful. It can give more clues to what's going on. But again, it's it's often the observation of the parent that something's distinctly different with my child. And often when kids start to get joint pain, you'll notice that they're starting to walk funny. You'll see them grab their elbows, grab their shoulders, grab their knees. They're touching the body part that hurts. Again, can just be some other clues about what's going on. So, you know, if you start to see those symptoms that really come out of the blue, might be a red flag to investigate Lyme. Again, because it looks like a lot of other infections, it would be very easy to miss. Again, the bullseye rash, the CDC says 70% you know, of the people get it. In reality, it's probably less than 20%. So again, the people who get it, great, we know. And for the people who don't get it, you know, there's no really good way to necessarily assess that without looking at all these other types of symptoms. So the pretty broad uh, scope of how these symptoms can affect, you know, with acute Lyme disease. When it becomes more persistent, it gets even harder, and especially with autism, because we talk about now neurocognitive impairment, which children on spectrum mostly have anyway. So if they're foggy, if they're, you know, noticing, you know, problems with their motor function, a lot of the kids I see on the spectrum are already hypotonic. They got low muscle tone anyway, even before getting exposed to Lyme. So again, it, clinically, it can be very difficult to distinguish what's Lyme related, what's autism related. So that's why I think 
getting that uh, exam, getting the test, find out if that's what's going on, just because again, the symptoms alone may be very difficult to distinguish, you know, if that's Lyme or, or autism. But if you come to the conclusion after all that, that your child has been exposed to one of these tick-borne illnesses, you know, fortunately, again, there's a lot of things we can do to help improve function. Again, it's not really just about going in with antibiotics and killing the bug. Again, for acute Lyme disease, I think that's very appropriate. For more chronic or persistent Lyme disease, what we find in the literature is that often uh, the the antibiotics aren't very effective. When you're on antibiotics long term, of course, we have an increased risk of damaging your normal microbiome. And exactly. so, many, so many parents I work with you know, have spent years getting their child's gut back to functioning well. The yes. last thing we're going to do is undull that great work. And again, this is a common problem with you know antibiotics. It's beast. It's like if you're trying to kill the bad guy, you can't kill the bad guy without killing some of the good guys. Collateral damage, it's unavoidable. We can get probiotics, cows come home. That may help prevent getting diarrhea, which is a good thing, but it's never going to replace the totality of all the bugs that rep your normal microbiome. So right. And if our kids are very, very low on diversity as it is to start off with, and then we add the additional antibiotics, then we're really just diminishing that diversity as it is. And from my experience, that's not a good thing. And then we're opening that door for other opportunistic pathogens like ye become more prevalent. Oh, great. Now we need to add in antifungals and, you know, right. you know, polypharmacy starts adding up very quickly because now we have to start combating the effects of the, the other things. So, you know, in my world, when I see a child in the spectrum that's been diagnosed with Lyme, you know, we got to start the core things. And, you know, whether a child has Lyme or not, we still do this, I think it's the foundational work for any chronic illness. And gut and diet is, is really the two things that we, we have to start to really get the body to repair itself. You know, ah, I think so let's talk about that diet because I know you're really into the alkali diet. Tell us a little more about that because I, I, I need more information on this. So, you know, the alkaline diet, it's nothing new. It's been around for decades. Uh, I didn't invent this. This is not my thing. It's just I found practically and clinically. And again, I, I'm a Lyme patient myself. I went through the same thing that everybody with Lyme disease has gone through. I found that it, it made sense biochemically. The purpose of an alkaline diet is what you eat as it breaks down your body starts to make your cells more alkaline. And the exception of your skin, your stomach, your bladder, and for women, the vaginal area, which are very acidic, that's to help protect against outside invaders. The rest of your body and your cells are more or less alkaline. So when it's in that state, the cells function better, they repair tissue faster, you know, all the enzymes work the way they're supposed to. So if you think about it, like, you know, there's a reason that crops won't grow in acid rain. It, that acidic environment is just not hospitable to the soil and the crop. Well, our bodies are very similar. That acid environment is just not hospitable for growth and repair. In fact, it's much more hospitable to inflammation. And we're doing all these things to quell the inflammation and that and the brain and wherever else it exists in the body. So if we're feeding our kids foods that keep perpetuating that inflammatory cycle, you know, it's really difficult if you're doing all these other therapies to really get a toehold on any one thing and really see clinical improvement. So the nature of an alkaline diet in a nutshell is it's really a plant-based diet primarily, because what we find is most vegetables, when they break down, actually tend to be very alkaline forming. So we eat a lot of plants. We minimize animal protein and fruit. These foods tend to either be kind of droll or slightly acidic as they break down. It's not that you don't eat them. It's just the bulk of your diet. We try and keep it down to about 20, 25% of your intake for the week. And then the last part is really just eliminating all these pro-inflammatory foods, dairy, gluten, junk food, dyes, binders, fillers, all that. Processed. Kind of stuff. Yeah. It's all, all that crap. processed crap. If it's not if it's not grown or natural animal or plant and it's been processed, then it's probably not good for us. Yeah, what I learned is if you can't pull it out of the ground or off a bush or it didn't have a mother, it's probably not putting in your health. So, you know, when you go to the grocery store, you should only shut the perimeter of the door pretty much that food is. <laughs> you know, everything in between is all the processed box, junk stuff. And then you don't buy a few things here and there. You might need a condiment or whatever. But basically, all the whole foods are going to be on the outside of the uh, the store. So that's where you're going to spend the bulk of time doing your shopping. So the alkaline diet is a very 
uh, sustainable diet too. And what I like is, that, you know, we called it diet. It's not really a diet. It's not counting calories. It's not uh, restricting really anything that's nutrient dense. It's a way I think our paleo forefathers probably truly did eat. You know, we, we, we certainly eat animals at one every day. So I think animal protein was part of the early, you know, forefathers diet, but it wasn't the diet. It really was what forage off the ground, off bushes, off trees and so forth. So we're, I think more akin to that diet probably really looked like. Cause a lot of people I see when it's like, oh, I'm, you know, paleo diet, but I eat two pounds a day. Well, that's probably a little too much. And that can be very hard on the kidneys. So it's really a balanced based diet. It's nutrients, it's sustainable. And when I read all these other books out there on people who talk about treating autoimmune disease, treating MS, treating whatever else, we all pretty much uh, promoting the same diet. You know, everyone's got their little variation, more or less. It's, you know, eating mostly plant-based diet, get rid of the junk food and, you know, fairly minimal animal protein and things that are, you know, kind of in that category. So this all is- those things that that we've got ourselves as an American society completely addicted to eating just crap because that's the way we eat. So if we can get rid of an American diet and go back to eating the way we were before we started processing all our foods and, and you know, mass marketing to people, then maybe we could fix our gut. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, unfortunately, I think, you know, it's a bit of an American problem. You know, I spent a lot of time in Europe and I look at the way European children eat versus the way American children eat. I mean, you know, we start kids here on goldfish and and crackers and grains and things that aren't necessarily nutrient dense uh, at all. And European children eat quite differently. I mean, they start whole foods very early in life. So we start developing a palate. Uh, American child early that, you know, maybe it's, you know, junk food or, or whatever it is. And as they get older, it's just kind of hard to break away from that pattern. So I think if you're a parent and your child are still infants or, you know, you're pregnant or you're thinking about having future children, if you can, as a parent, get in the habit of not introducing those type of foods early in life, it really makes it a lot easier because the kids never develop that kind of palate. And it's just yeah. easier to get them to eat, you know, whole foods, real food, and they're not at least craving, you know, the junk stuff. So if we get them back on onto this more of an alkali natural diet and we start feeding them better, then we know that, that we can turn a microbiome around in just a couple of weeks if we start fixing our diet. Um, so once, you, once you've got parents working on the diet, then you go to herbal protocols? Um, so yeah, after we kind of got the, you know, and again, for kids that have, you know, different gastrointestinal issues, again, you're going to have to work with your practitioner to do that investigative work as to the why, you know, some kids it's chronic constipation, other kids it's chronic diarrhea and everything in between. So whether it's diet related, whether there's, you know, a, just an infection, whether there's something like SIBO, uh, you know, that's where, you know, you'll have to work with your doctor or your healthcare provider to try and sort what is it that, you know, is actually causing those underlying gut issues. But diet is no, no doubt a huge, huge part of it. And I think so many kids, whether they're on the spectrum or not, when we clean up their diet, get them with their food sensitivities, fix the leaky gut, you know, normal, regular, healthy bowel movements, it also tells me that, you know, we're giving their immune system a much better chance to function well. And certainly yeah. if we're dealing with something like Lyme disease or any other type of persistent infection, you know, the gut counts for up to 80% of your immune function. So if the gut's not functioning well, ultimately the immune system is not going to function well. So, you know, gut isn't just about the the digestion and absorb nutrients. That's a huge part of it, but it also is a key in regulating your immune system. And again, for all these kids that we see that have these immune issues, this the easiest, fastest way to get their immune system balanced is just making sure they're eating good quality food. So, you know, beyond that, you know, once we get the gut and the diet under control, then yeah, I think the next step is we need to start targeting Lyme and, you know, these other co-infections. And this is where I think herbs can be tremendously beneficial. The beauty of herbs too, is that because they're plants, our body is accustomed to breaking down plants. We don't get the same kind of effects that we get in your antibiotics. So certainly the impact onto the microbiome is way less. I won't say it's zero, uh, you can see some GI issues with herbs, but they are rare. 
they are quite rare. So, you know, having treated over 7,000 Lyme patients, you know, it's it's less than percent really have problems with where we have to either stop or switch them to something else. So, fortunately, our body's well adept to handling, uh, you know, plants. The other thing with plants, the plants have a lot of different constituents in them. So not only do they target Lyme or some of these other infections, they're anti-inflammatory, they help promote better circulation, they boost our immune system, they might be soothing to the GI tract. So we have the ability to mix and match, you know, different herbal preparations to find out what each individual person really needs. So I think that's incredibly powerful because it really is no one size approach. We can really say, okay, this is what's going on with your child. These are the issues that we need to address. What's the best way that we're going to get there? I know this herb, that herb, that herb, let's mix these together and hopefully get that synergistic effect that, you know, we're dealing with Lyme, but we're also dealing with potentially some of these other consequences of what Lyme's done to the body. And I found, you know, again, mm -hmm. over the years, there's a lot of great companies that make products that are very kid friendly. You know, some of the kids I see, you know, they eat four foods, they're very picky. We can't get any anything in them. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of companies that make different tinctures. We're doing drop doses, very small quantities. You know, we can mix them into, you know, water, sometimes a little diluted juice. Sometimes we can even put it in food. So we've got a lot of ways that we can get these in. They're clinically effective and the kids actually tolerate it and don't fight you on, you know, one more thing. So, you know, herbs can again be really incredibly powerful as a tool to help, you know, target Lyme in these co-infections and get all these other benefits in controlling what Lyme's done to the body. And then beyond that, I think you need to start looking at just normal lifestyle factors. You know, are your kids sleeping well? Some of the kids I see on the spectrum are not great sleepers. And yeah. when you sleep deeply, that's when their body repairs. That's when their brain detoxifies. So we need to find those strategies that's going to help encourage better sleep. So is the difficulty, you know, falling asleep, staying asleep? Is it both? You know, there's a lot of things we can do nutritionally to try and help facilitate that. But a lot, it's also about sleep hygiene. I think it's also training your body to get in a specific pattern for sleep. So depending on the age of your child, I mean, I think electronics, again, have been the one thing that's probably been the worst thing that's happened to children in regards mm -hmm. to their sleep. Because at night, they want to play on the iPad or play a video game or do whatever. And it stimulates the brain. You know, we know that blue light coming off these iPads or tricks your brain to think it's daytime. And therefore, when it's time to fall asleep, their brain's kind of jacked up and they don't want to fall asleep or they have interrupted sleep. So we need to disconnect kids from all electronics an hour and a half to two hours before you actually want them to go to bed to give their brain a chance to kind of decompress from that activity, you know, get them in the habit of doing, you know, do board games if they can play that, do something that's quiet. Uh, some sort of family activity that's not going to be overstimulating to the brain. That's one of the best ways to help get your child prepared for bed. And then again, if they still have trouble, uh, you know, falling asleep, staying asleep, you know, we've got different nutrients. Sometimes melatonin works well for falling asleep. Other nutrients like magnesium and glycine and 5-HTP can help people stay asleep. Lots of different herbs available as well to help facilitate better sleep. So definitely, you know, talk to your healthcare provider about what's appropriate for your child. But be aware that we have a lot of different things that are non-drug related that can help facilitate better sleep so that we're not constantly putting kids on, you know, clonidine and some of these other types of medications to help get better sleep. Uh, so sleep's really important. You know, physical activity, of course, is very important. Getting the blood moving, that helps bring more blood to the brain, more oxygen, more nutrients, gets the lymph draining. So I like kids as much as they can to be physically active. So if they're physically capable to do, you know, some of those activities, try and get them, you know, 30 minutes a day of being very physically active. Uh, and then beyond that, you know, I think looking at environment. Environmental control is another thing that anybody can do, no matter where you live in the world. It's not something that's taxing to the budget, so it's not another thing you need to pay money for, but just controlling the exposure inside and outside the home of, you know, to different chemicals. Uh, we know that a lot of different toxins can accumulate in the body. And I think most of us would probably agree that kids on the spectrum, most of them are not good detoxifiers. That's probably part of what led to autism in the first place. But we yeah. see that pretty much across the board that little things affect, uh, you know, these kids uh, profoundly. They truly are the canaries in the coal mine. So those little toxic exposure on what's in skincare products, what's in soap, what's in shampoo, uh, the Glade, uh, 
you know, diffuser, you plug in the wall. <laughs> air fresheners. <laughs> air fresheners, these toxic chemicals, scented cans, pesticides, herbicides, you know, all these things, again, do have a cumulative effect, or I should say can. Laundry soap. Laundry soap. Laundry I mean, soap. just the silliest things. You catch your kid sucking on his clothes and you can't figure out why. It's because there's gluten and stuff in the laundry soap that he's really addicted to and he's just sucking on his shirt. You know? Exactly. So it's much stuff. As much as you as a parent can control the environment, you know, when they're outside the home, I recognize it's harder. You know, when they're in school, I know a lot of schools, especially nowadays, if your kids are back in class live, you know, schools are going way overboard on sanitizer and, you know, fumigating uh -huh. the, the classrooms after each day. So no doubt uh, kids in school are getting even more exposure than normal to potentially some things that could just be another uh, trigger for them. So as much as we can limit the exposure, you know, you can work with your provider about detox strategies to get rid of what's already there. But as much as we can stop the influx, and again, there's so much you can just in and around the home of getting all the toxic chemicals out. With the Windex and the 409 and the soft scrub and all this stuff, there's a lot of natural products out there that will do the job, keep your home nice and clean without adding to that toxic load for really everybody who's living in the home. So the benefits are beyond just what you're doing for your child. This is also what you're doing for everyone else living in the household. And again, this doesn't add to your, your budget. These you know clean green chemicals, or I shouldn't say chemicals, you know, products are no uh, no more expensive than what you're spending on a conventional chemical. So again, so much you can do to help keep the home a safe haven and reduce that burden. So, you know, sort of cumulatively, you know, we've got all these different strategies to really treat the whole person. So, you know, we're controlling the diet, we're improving gut and health, we're targeting the organism, we're controlling the environment, stopping that influx of toxins, and we're trying to manage their life in a way that, again, just helps the body function the way it's supposed to. And if we kind of do all those steps, you know, we can see a lot of progress in our kids and see how, you know, the inflammation goes down, the gut functions better. And on the heels of that, sometimes, you know, we see better language, better cognition, improved behavior, the tantrums start, stop, the head banging stops, they're sleeping better. You know, really across the board, we can see both improvements in their physical, mental, and emotional well-being once we get all these pieces in check. So again, sure. it's, just, it's just a strategy that I've found works well for my Lyme patients and even for children on spectrum. You know, this is something that uh, if you get in the hands of a practitioner who understands this, I think a lot of MAPS doctors out there understand this at some level. They may or may not be Lyme experts, but certainly they understand the rest of these pieces. So it's always a great place and then if you need a Lyme expert to kind of step in to handle that piece, fortunately, there's a lot of us around the country and the world that are doing this kind of work and they can help navigate that next step. Okay. Um, I, I, moving around, I know that you're talking a little bit about um, the herbal protocols, but I also had a question about low dose immunotherapy. Um, is that something that you use or um, do you want to talk to us a little bit about, about that? Sure. Yeah. Low dose immunotherapy has really been one of these therapies that I'll say has been a game changer in my practice. LDI or low dose immunotherapy, we call LDI. This was developed by Dr. Ty Vincent. And gosh, I'm losing track of time. I want to say maybe it's been about seven years now. And he's a medical doctor in Hawaii. And there's another therapy called LDA, low dose allergy therapy, which is a treatment for sensitivities, environmental allergies like mold and pollen and dust and cat dog and so forth. And that's been around since the 1960s. Dr. Vincent had been doing LDA in his practice and he realized that the way our body is responding to some microbes was really no different than the way it was responding to something like pollen or mold. So if you can imagine your immune system treating a pathogen like an allergen, it engages a completely different part of the immune system. So what we're really trying to do with this therapy is trying to reset how the immune system is reacting to a specific microbe. You know, we know from the research, like if you get exposed to strep, you can get rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease. This is the effect, an immune effect, an autoimmune effect of having been exposed to strep. So it's not the infection itself that's the problem, it's the immune reaction to the organism that's now cross-reacting with our own tissue. And we know from the research, Lyme and a lot of other infectious agents can trigger a similar type of autoimmune problem. So if we think about Lyme disease more of an autoimmune issue, particularly with chronic Lyme, than just an infection, 
it does shift a little bit of the way that we want to approach it because again, now we want to try and help balance the immune system, kind of downregulate that part of the immune system that's making more antibodies that drives allergy, drives autoimmunity, and start to get that back in balance. And this has been a way to try and do that. And the way it's essentially done is, you know, the antigen selection is based on sometimes tests that your child's had. Maybe it was a blood test that said they had Lyme or they had strep. Maybe it was a stool test that showed an overgrowth of yeast. Maybe it was an organic acid test that showed an overgrowth of clostridia. So the testing sometimes gives us clues about what the exposure is. But at the end of the day, it really is kind of trial and error where we just have to try different antigens, see how child reacts, and then we kind of from there. But what's really kind of interesting is that if we find the right antigen and the right dose, uh, you'll see changes sometimes within 24, 48 hours. So it's yeah, not like gonna therapies. Ask. Yeah, it's not one of these therapies we have to wait months and months to figure out if it's helping. Sometimes when we start, we'll start at very weak dilutions and the parents say, well, I gave them the dose. I didn't really notice any changes. Okay, fine. Well, then we can give kind of incrementally the next strongest dilution. So much like if you were to give a medication, if you were going to start at, you know, five milligrams, but the target dose might be 100 milligrams, you could go five to 10 to 20 to 50. You can kind of do these incremental changes and then see if you hit that spot where there's improvement, but not overshoot the target where you get a bad reaction. And what's kind of interesting about LDI is that if you have the right antigen and the wrong dose, i.e. it's too strong, it'll actually make the symptoms worse. And of course, as a parent, you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know what you gave them. They're so much worse. Well, from our side, it's like, yeah, we don't like to make kids worse, of course, but it's also proving that's part of the problem. So there is a little bit of a diagnostic aspect of this. Like if I give a child a strep and C and their behavior gets worse, I now know that strep is what's causing the behavior problems. So, so it's a, Herx, it's, a Herxheimer it's reaction. Not there. a Herx reaction no. at all. It's not a die-off reaction. It? it is an immune reaction. It's the autoimmune reaction that's triggering the symptom. It's okay. different than when a true Herx is really the organism breaking down and releasing a toxin into okay. your body. This has nothing to do with killing anything. The LDI is not about killing the bug at all. It's, it's really about training the body to develop an immune system towards something as opposed to killing something in the body. It's complete opposite. We're, instead of upregulating your immune system, we're trying to turn it off. We're trying okay. to turn off that mechanism that's geared towards autoimmunity. So we're not interfering with your ability to fight infection at all. It's not going to make you more disposed to getting cold, flus, and other things like that. That part of your immune system can be completely intact and function fine. This is really targeting, again, what they call that TH2, T helper cell 2 pathway drives autoimmunity. So that we're trying to, to shut down. And again, this is a way I found for a lot of people, again, I, I use this with a lot of my Lyme patients. I use it with a lot of kids uh, with autism. My, my best case, and I speak about this a lot when I do lecture to Taka and other uh, autism organizations, I have a, a person that I've been working with for some time now. He's now 20, gotta be 28, I think. Uh, I inherited him from a doctor that retired when I moved out here to California. He has autism. And when I met him, I think he was 20 or 21 years old, he had very limited language. And fortunately, the doctor he would work with was an environmental medicine doctor, did some great work. He had a lot of gut issues as a child. The gut issues were pretty much resolved. I mean, he was a physically healthy person, but he had very minimal language and was still minimally functional. In addition to that, he's also about 6'5", and at the time was about 280 pounds. He's a big boy. And fortunately, he has no behavior issues. He's not aggressive or violent. He's just a big, big guy, but fairly uh, non-functional. And we started doing things. I started, we, you know, we tested him, treated for food sensitivities, which hadn't been done since he was three years old, found some food stuff, started working on that. He started getting improvements in his language. But when we added the LDI, uh, it was a game changer. And in the course of a year, he went from having, he probably had a dozen words, mostly for basic needs. He went from that to being conversational. Conversational oh. to the point that he picked up the phone, called another one of his friends with autism, invited him to go see Alvin and the Chipmunks at the movie theater. It was around Christmas time. And uh, they went to the theater, saw Alvin and the Chipmunks and had a great time. And he ended up getting a job uh, working at a supermarket, you know, bagging groceries and collecting carts. Uh, with some supervision, but his whole life changed. And See, uh, those those are the questions that I get asked all the time by other moms. You know, is there a cutoff point when we can start improving the lives of our our children? And 
I don't think there is a cutoff point. I think that everybody's life, because everybody's a unique individual, like you said, that I think everybody's life is, you know, can be improved with what, like what you said. So I find that fascinating. I'm really, really excited that you shared that with us because there's so many parents asking me, you know, my, my son or daughter is 19, 20, 21, and we've had all these issues and we're still not seeing gains. Is it even worth the attempt to put in the cost? I'm like there's improving anybody's life is always worth Worth. Yeah, you know, I, I think somewhere along the line, people were under the impression that, you know, neuroplasticity gets hardwired at some point. Yeah. And again, we know from research, you know, when people had strokes when they're in their 60s, 70s, that the brain can, you know, rewire itself, can improve, you know, uh, speech again. So, mm -hmm. I mean, this particular young man was a great reminder for me that here at 20 or 21, he went from being I won't say nonverbal, he had some language, but mainly verbal to being conversational. Now, he still has autism, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he, but he's, he's, he's more functional. The quality of life, him and his family is so dramatic that now, you know, mom doesn't have to hover over him 24 seven, you know, he now goes and she drops him off at his job and then picks him up and he's happy. He's got friends. He's got other people. He's like, he can be more social. So his world has opened up tremendously. And again, the, the stress off of the family, what it's done for their family, it's just been amazing to see. And you know, we're continuing to work with them. In fact, actually, he was in the office today uh, seeing uh, an osteopath we have working here to continue working on his structure. And he continues to do really, really well. So. So I, I love hearing stories like that because I know so many parents of, you know, older kids as well that have kind of put the biomedical idea out of their mind because they think oh, he's already a, a teenager or he's, you know, that that window has closed and the window never closes. Like you said, the, the stroke patients can yeah, always well, recover. People can always recover and everybody's an individual. So everybody's needs are different. So what works for my kid might not work for your kid, but hey, it's always worth the try for in, improved quality of life. So, well, so I basically, always, I always think of Thomas Edison. Thomas had a great saying: "Goes, I learned ten thousand ways not to make a light bulb." Exactly. I know, and I think this happens in the autism world, right? It's like we find a lot of things that don't work for kids, but then we find those things that do. And again, don't ever, ever, ever compare your child to someone else's. It's apples and oranges. It worked for one child, might not work for yours, and vice versa. And I see this in the line. I mean, I tell you, I think Facebook in so many ways has been one of the worst that happened to the medical community because you go online, you read about people that have similar issues, and you're always the impression, not always, the impression that you know people just don't get better you know the lime facebook groups i all for that if you if you spend 10 minutes on any lime group and just read through all the comments and posts you would be under the impression no one gets better but all the people who came they're not on facebook they're not posting they have no reason to be there anymore because they're better and i think same yeah. thing when you got ever child parents stay in these groups and continue to talk about how wonderful the child yeah, it, it's it's difficult as your kid starts to get better. You really aren't in those groups anymore because you're not researching those problems anymore. So you're not in that topic group. You're right. Um, but then it's really important for parents like like myself who've had good experiences to keep coming back and sharing so that other physicians and other parents know that there is hope out there and there are ways that we can help improve the quality of life. And, there, and there's never a cutoff point. You can always improve quality of life for anybody. Also for the moms too. I mean, we can work on ourselves as well. But, um, but I think that overall, for the topic of Lyme, um, let's go back to that because I'm changing the subject. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we treat the organism, um, then we treat the other immune distractors, such as the food allergies, the environmental um, issues. We detox the body. We eliminate heavy metals. Uh, then we fix the endocrine dysregulation. Then we work on getting proper sleep, making sure I get this right. Then we reduce inflammation, improve our nutritional status, improve the mitochondrial function. We didn't really touch on that much. And improve circulation and reduce autoimmunity. So maybe we should touch on that to improve mitochondrial function a tiny bit. 
Yeah, I again, I think so many kids on the spectrum that I see in practice have some element of mitochondrial dysfunction, and whether that's genetic, inherited, or acquired, always hard to know. Unfortunately, again, there's not a lot of labs out there that do mitochondrial testing. You know, Iliad, I think, is the one lab that was used to do the the uh, real fun testing. And again, it's not perfect, but uh, I think, you know, clinically, you've got a mito kid. You know, these are the floppy kids. They start early in life, have low G, muscle tone. Their fun, gross motor coordination might be compromised. You know, these are the kids that aren't, you know, jumping on the playground and wanting to climb on the monkey bars because it's just too exhausting, too much work, uh, too difficult. So at least clinically, and suggest there's some element of mitochondrial dysfunction. But because mitochondria are literally the parts of the cell that drive energy metabolism, that drive cell repair, if the mitochondria aren't functioning well, again, it's just hard for the tissue to repair itself and function better. So I find a few downsides to supporting mitochondrial pathways. This is mostly nutritional. If there is something you're aware of that damages mitochondria, this comes back to environmental control. So we know a lot of chemicals in the environment can damage mitochondria. Lyme disease itself can damage your mitochondria. So some in persistent infections can. Uh, antibiotics can do that. So if there's things that we're aware of that are damaging mitochondria, so we want to try and stop as quickly as possible. And once we do that, then we want to start, you know, re the mitochondria. So there's a lot of nutrients we use, you know, things like coenzyme Q10, acetylcarnitine, vitamin C, magnesium, you know, all these nutrients play an important role in making the mitochondria function better and repairing the chondria that are damaged. What you need to be aware of though is that that, that repair doesn't happen quickly and potentially taking years for that damage to occur, it might take, you know, months to years to get to a point where you feel confident that you've got that back on track again. So again, this is once you start on that pathway of repairing mitochondria, uh, it, it might feel like you've been, wow, I've been giving my child these things for a long time. You know, the changes aren't happening super quickly. And in my practice, you no, know, my expectation, whenever I recommend and you, you know, herb, supplement, homeopathic, whatever it is, I have a pretty good idea of what to expect on timeline of when I want to see improvement. And by and large, I expect to see improvement usually within two or three months, just about anything that we do. Uh, mitochondria is one that I will say, look, this might be six months. This might take a little bit longer. So hang in there with it. If you're not seeing quick results, uh, that's okay. Uh, again, there's nothing really toxic about this. I mean, if you get too much magnesium, you'll get diarrhea. B6 does have toxicity, but you would have to give astronomical doses and the doses we give kids don't come anywhere close to that. So giving normal recommended doses, that's really not much of an issue. But again, it's one of those things that can help stimulate the mitochondria, get it to function better again. And again, even physical activity can help, you know, rebuild that mitochondria. So it's the catch 22 that when you're mitochondrial is, is damaged, you know, you're more tired. And then the idea of trying to do physical activity again to overcompensate for that, it's challenging. But if you can do it, at least you no know, minimal activity, that is a way to kind of help, you know, get the mitochondria to function a little bit better. Um, I just saw a quick uh, comment that came across here from Carla. Is it true that you don't herx from treating against Babesia? Uh, you can herx from anything. You can herx from any tr uh, treatment for any infection. So no, that is not true. You can you can get diet from Babesia, and I do see that in practice too. Babesia because it's uh, related to it's a cousin of malaria. It's a blood parasite. It infects your red blood cells. Herxing from Babesia can sometimes be nasty because in, the, all, in addition to all the other things that people experience, uh, Babesia does tend to trigger fever. So sometimes we'll get people get you know more fever more frequently. The temperature goes up a little bit. Uh, air hunger is a common problem with Babesia. So people complain their air gets worse. Uh, but yeah, definitely you can get die off from Babesia. I see here uh, another Another one of our contributors had sent me a question earlier and wanted me to touch on this. Um, says other herbal, blah, blah, other herbal Lyme protocol from Stephen uh, Buna. Uh -huh. She said she's curious if about your opinion on hypothermia treatment for Lyme and is aphoresis and probably saying that. Mm -hmm. And the, they're they're two. She says they are two big hardcore treatments and she wanted to know what your opinion on those things were. 
Well, the first part was Stephen Buhner. I mean, Stephen Buhner is an herbalist. He's written two books, one on Lyme disease, one on co-infections. Uh, his protocols work really well. It's just uh, they're different herbs. Uh, he uses things like Japanese knotweed and cryptolepis and Ceta acuta. Uh, many of them have been studied in, in vitro and found they work very well against Lyme and some of the co-infections. So I like them. I use them. Uh, the challenging part with some of them is uh, just access to the herbs. Uh, or some of them are not easily available as tinctures. A lot of them are capsules. And if your child can't swallow a capsule, that gets to be a problem because a lot of these herbs are really very bitter. So if you break open the capsule and just, you know, kind of stir it in something, it just might be hard to get in. But as an herbalist and as a protocol, I like his stuff and I do use his herbs. Uh, you know, other types of hardcore treatments for Lyme, hyperthermia, we really don't do in the U.S., uh, if you want it, you typically have to go to Mexico or go. There's different clinics in Europe, Switzerland and Germany that do it. I have had a handful of people that have done it. I can't say I've had anyone in my practice that's raved about it. They did it. They're like, no, nah, I felt a little bit better. I've had a lot of people said they didn't feel any better at all. Uh, it certainly isn't natural. I mean, getting your core body temperature up to this super high temperature, and I know the way they do it in Europe, I'm not sure how they do it in Mexico, but you know, basically it's a six hour procedure where they spend two hours getting your, bringing your core body temperature up. You're sedated the whole time because you can't stand being that hot. You would be crawling out of your skin. And then they keep you at temperature for two hours and they spend another two hours bringing you down. So, you know, people, keeping people in sedation for six hours. Uh, and the goal is to try and kill the bug. I think some of the fundamental issues with Lyme that I will disagree with a lot of my Lyme colleagues out there is that I don't think it's just about killing the bug. It's about what the bug's done to your immune system. And right. hyperthermia is not going to fix that. So if you had acute Lyme disease, would hyperthermia be helpful? Probably. Um, again, I don't know what the availability is in Europe of people who have acute Lyme disease who get that. Uh, certainly most people who are getting it that I'm aware of have had it for quite a while. So uh, in my practice, again, in, in fairness, it's been a limited number of people who've done it. I've got a patient actually going down to a clinic in Mexico in the next week or two who's going to have it done. So I'll see what her experience is like. But And the handful of people I've seen, I, it hasn't been a wow. Apheresis, plasmapheresis, in concept, uh, makes sense. Again, this is basically a filter of your blood where they pull blood out of one arm and they filter it and then they put it back in the other arm. Uh, in the United States, it's hard to get done. There's not very many clinics that do it. It's super expensive. I know one clinic, I think, charges ten or $15,000 a pop, and you would probably need multiple to get the full multiple benefits. Tries. So, you know, the nature of that is, you know, it's is it just Lyme toxins? Is it other toxins? Depending on the kind of filters they're using, as I've come to learn that there are different filters you can hook up to the machine, depending on kind of what you want to pull out. So is it the right filter? Um, I did it myself personally. My first treatment, there was pretty noticeable improvement. It lasted about two weeks because uh, my neuropathy went down a lot after doing it. I did it a second time and there was no change at all. And it was super expensive <laughs> here in Orange County, California. So I think, you know, there's some potential for it. For people that might have a lot of circulating antibodies that might be triggering inflammation, it may help reduce that body burden. But if the thing that's triggering that inflammatory process is still in place, you may find that you get temporary benefit. And then at some point, whether it's weeks or months, you start to get the problem again because you haven't really addressed the underlying trigger. So in conjunction with other therapies, I think it actually would be quite helpful. I know the, the Dr. Morales at Lyme, uh, Mexico in Puerto Vallarta, he's a hema. Uh, uh, by training. And they do a lot of plasmapheresis. And I know he's had some great results with people in their clinic and they do multiple treatments while you're there. Uh, unfortunately, again, it's just, you know, we don't really do a lot here in the U S so people who really want that are probably relegated to having to go outside of the U S but as a treatment, again, I, I think it has potential benefit. It just, it need to be in conjunction with other therapies. They're going to try and help modulate the immune system and stop that reaction. Cause otherwise I feel like if you did it once or twice, you may find in the handful of weeks or months, you're kind of back to square one again. Yeah. So I also had another question from another parent who had asked about um, FMT and whether or not you thought that that might be a potential for treatment for Lyme. Uh, potentially, I think, you know, with FMT, uh, there's a lot of uptick or a lot of uh, potential benefits, particularly if the history of someone 
who may have been on antibiotics, you know, early in their life where their microbiome was already disrupted even before they got Lyme, I think as a way again to repopulate the gut, it's amazing. I mean, I'm hope in my lifetime, we get to that point where FT, FMT becomes common. I think it has potential for autism and MS and any other autoimmune disease. Uh, and again, unfortunately, FMT in the United States is only done really under an IRB, which means you need to be part of a study uh, through a medical institution in the U.S. Again, there are clinics outside of the U.S. to do FMT, and I do know people who have gone outside of the U.S. to have it done. And by and large, most people tend to respond pretty well. Yeah, It's still pretty expensive if you do it outside of the U.S., but uh, again, for the people who've done it, I'd say the overwhelming majority of people did see clinical improvement. I know two people with multiple sclerosis that went to the clinic in the Bahamas, which unfortunately has been closed during the pandemic and had great responses. I had a few kids with autism go to that clinic. I've had a few kids with autism go to the clinic in Mexico. Uh, again, so, you know, I, I think it has a lot of potential benefit. You know, when you go outside of the U.S., you do need to make sure the clinic is, you know, reputable. Uh, again, I only know of really two clinics that uh, I've had people go to, that I've done my own investigation and feel like they're doing a good job of screening their donors, testing the donor material, making sure they don't accidentally infect someone. Uh, I'm only aware of one adverse effect that was done with FMT. And again, it was kind of done outside of a, a study or even a reputable clinic and someone got an infection and died. But that's one person in you know, however many years that they've been doing this. So I think FMT has got tremendous potential. I think we're going to find hopefully in the next five to 10 years that this is going to be a common uh, therapy outside of just you know, Clostridium difficile infections. And I think we're going to find a lot of potential benefit in you know, rebalancing, you know, truly rebalancing the gut. Because, oh my gosh, how many people do you know that's never been on an, any antibiotics at all, has only eaten organic, healthy food? <laughs> it's like, I don't know anybody like that. Nobody. So, Nobody. I mean, that's not how Western they, medicine works. I mean, from day one, they're prescribing us something. So... <clears throat> So yeah. yeah, I don't know anybody who's who's got a perfect microbiome. That's part of why I wonder when we decide that we're going to do these FMT transfers, where are we going to find the perfect poopers? Exactly. What, where are those people? <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't know where they found their donors because I think you know finding a healthy donor in the U.S. would be very challenging. So yeah, I've never talked to the clinics to find out where they their donors, who they are. I mean, I guess in a perfect world, you would like an aged matched donor because you know the gut of a child is a little bit different than the gut of an adult and it does change as you get older but uh for now i think just a healthy donor uh that's free of infection that has you know a good distribution of bugs uh is helpful and again this is an area that's going to continue to grow i mean there's so much being done on it now it's just we haven't quite to a point where we're ready to make it prime time and just there's a root there people yeah. Well, I'm really excited to to get the information out to a lot of parents. Um, for a long time, I wasn't aware that Lyme disease was even a thing with our kids and and did not know that 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 was pretty common. I mean, that's what do you say? 30 percent is what you're saying? Guesstimate or estimate is that the. In my patient population, and I again, I've spoken to other doctors, treat Lyme autism, I concur. Dr. Dave Dornfeld in uh, New Jersey kind of feels it's the same in his population. Yeah, I saw Enrique ask, uh, is Lyme always transmitted through a tick? Uh, yeah. The only majority of them are through tick bites. We do know that there is a potential for maternal transmissions. Mom has Lyme and pregnant. We've got at least three studies now showing that mom can pass Lyme on to child. However, typically, if that's the case, what we see is birth defects in the children are born, some children are stillborn, and yeah, developmental delays. I think the big difference is, you know, these are the kids who are, I mean, they never, ever develop normally. These are the kids who miss their, uh, their milestones from early on. It's a little bit different than a lot of the kids I see that were developing normally up until a certain point, 15 months, 18 months, whatever, and then they started seeing the regression. For me, that's less likely related to, to Lyme. But again, there's no research on this really at all. Uh, no one's following kids born to moms with Lyme to see what happens over the course of next year. So it's always possible. I know a lot of parents I see that have kids on the spectrum because they have Lyme or suspicious they pass it down. 
you know, by the time we test their kids, if they test positive, I don't know if that's from mom. I don't know if that's something they acquired naturally. And depending on where we live, when I practice in Connecticut, I mean, everyone's exposed. You walk outdoors, you're exposed. So yeah, it's a function of where you live as well. And yeah, yeah, 30 percent seems high. I was kind of surprised, but uh, that's what I've observed. And so well, that's that's one other point I wanted to uh, mention too. what you just said that where Lyme is in the United States. And that, that I think is a common assumption that, oh, well, I live in a state where there is no Lyme. And I, I heard you say in one of your presentations before that it's all over the United States. It's all over, all over now. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the CDC's reports, Lyme's been reported in all 50 states, including Alaska and Hawaii. Now, are these ticks in in those areas? Not necessarily, but I mean, ticks are everywhere. I don't know if you just saw what came out, like I think two or three days ago, um, that the beach is here in California loaded with ticks that carry Lyme. They actually took the ticks, they measured them, found they had Lyme. And I've had doctors here in California tell my patients, oh, no, there's no Lyme in California. I had one doctor yeah. tell a patient there's not even deer in California. Never mind all the deer crossing signs up and down the roads. You know, this, this level of ignorance. Obviously, that doctor doesn't get out much. Uh, um. Apparently not. <laughs> but I mean, this is kind of what we're dealing with. I mean, yeah, if you live in the central part of the United States where it's kind of believed that Lyme doesn't exist, you know, I've had patients in Texas and Arizona and, you know, even Colorado say, no, their doctors say there's no Lyme here. And what we found is over the years is that, you know, ticks have really migrated, especially these deer ticks migrated outside of their area, which used to be, you know, New England and the central Midwest, you know, the East Coast, the West Coast is inundated. It's all pushing in towards the central part of the country. You know, birds, migratory patterns have changed. And, you know, tick jumps on a bird, bird flies hundreds of miles trips off. And now that tick or ticks have another place to create a new colony. And you know, I think this idea of, you know, you can get Lyme if you're in the country or if you're in the part of the world, I don't know that that's really true anymore. And, you know, COVID-19, again, people did travel. They did go all over the place. So that acquisition of Lyme may not have occurred from, you know, where you happen to live. But, um, yeah, it, it truly is a, an endemic problem. And, again, Lyme for the last many years has been the fastest growing infectious disease in the world. Well, thank you so, so much problem. for letting us know all this information. It's so important to share it. And I... I really enjoyed talking with you today. Thank you so much. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share with us from your book? Or I, And I also wanted to put out there because a lot of um, parents like to listen to podcasts too. I really enjoy listening to your Lyme podcasts. So um, anybody who likes to listen to podcasts, I would suggest you do that. He's got a lot of really great information. Also information for um, about moms and what's going on with us too. So check that out. Um, but thank you so much today. I'm just, this has been great. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you so much for having me, Dana. I appreciate it. I really appreciate it. Um, so everybody, thank you so much for uh, tuning in and um, check out Dr. Ingalls' book. Check out the website uh, and listen to his podcast. You guys can learn a lot. And everybody have a great day. Hope everybody enjoyed the podcast or the uh, interview. <laughs>